Hello, what? What time is it? This is the Anthropocene Epoch. Wow, that carbon dates me. So that illustrates how the term Anthropocene is, is reaching everywhere, uh, including to into Dilbert's cartoons. So we'll be thinking about, about this um, and term the Anthropocene in terms of a new unit of geological time. And so I'm going to be talking about how we make a, a new division of geological time. Um, but there is, of course, the point um, as to why one would do it anyway. Do we need one? Do we need an additional uh, division of time? What's the, what's the point in doing it? And not everybody's convinced about that. Um, and if we, um, and so one of the answers to that is, is that actually the Earth isn't behaving in the same way as it used to, and that there are lots of markers in geological archives that show that it's different. Um, if that's the case, and we really are in a different epoch, what's the trajectory? Where are we going? Um, we, you know, we've been used to being having ice ages and interglacials. Things are warming up now. What's what's going to happen uh, with that? So we'll, we'll just peek a little bit into the, the future as well. Now, there's a quote uh, uh, in a moment from a guy called Clive Hamilton, um, who's written a book about the fate of humans in the Anthropocene. And, and he writes these sanitary words. Some scientists even write, welcome to the Anthropocene. At first I thought they were being ironic, but now I see they are not, and that's scary. The idea of the Anthropocene is not welcoming. It should frighten us, and scientists should present it as such. So in other words, that's, that's one justification for, for actually going to the trouble of de formally defining an Anthropocene is to draw very specific attention to um, a difference in the world that has been actually created during my lifetime. Now then, here's the, here's the whole geological record just summarized in this, um, this stratigraphic chart from the International uh, Stratigraphic Commission. And we can see that it goes from uh, the present day, and they've got Anthropocene as a kind of, with an asterisk against it, as something that might happen at some point at the top. And we've got Holocene and Pleistocene, they're all part of the Quaternary, and then we go back to Neogene and Paleogene, and they're all part of the Cenozoic. Before the Cenozoic was the Mesozoic, and then before that, the, um, the, the, the Paleozoic, and then before that, the Precambrian divided into Archean and Proterozoic. So it's all neatly laid out. And in recent decades, there's been a sustained effort by stratigraphers to make formal definitions of the different divisions of, um, uh, of, of uh, ge geological time and the rocks that form uh, during those, uh, those time periods. And that process of dividing up the geological record is called chronostratigraphy. So that's different from lithostratigraphy, which is about um, rocks of different rock types succeeding one another, and biostratigraphy, which is to do with um, changes in, in different types of fossils. And there are several other types of stratigraphy as well. But chronostratigraphy just emphasizes that the divisions we're making, we're, we're, there should be synchronous divisions across the whole planet. An example of one of those uh, would be the Mesozoic, um, uh, Cenozoic uh, boundary. Um, Actually, I've written that. That's in, that's not what I was expecting. I was expecting Paleozoic Mesozoic boundary because that's where there's a big arrow here on the right hand side. So that's an example of a boundary there. That's at, dated at 251.9. And the Mesozoic Cenozoic boundary is over here. And of course, that's the one uh, when the dinosaurs died out and a big asteroid hit the Earth, and that's at 66 um, million years over, over there. So, uh, so that those are. Uh, certainly that one is one that uh, the general public know, knows a lot about. Now a boundary that's defined, it's defined at one specific place in the world which is used as a comparator for everything else. Um, and we call this informally a golden spike and the reason for that will become apparent later. Um, and technically it's, it's known as a GSSP and a GSSP is a global stratotype section and point. Um, so a bit of a mouthful, but GSSP is easier to uh, to recall. So each of these little pins here, these golden pins, represents one of these um, place, uh, one of these uh, geological boundaries, which has been defined in a formal way. 
Um, so that there's a there's a bureaucratic process and uh, it's actually quite a long-winded process involving um, all the experts on that particular period uh, over time. So in addition to being involved in the Anthropocene Working Group, I'm also involved in a Precambrian -pre Working Group, um, the Cryogenian. Uh, Cryogenian is when we uh, we have two global ice ages, the Snowball Earth ice ages, um, and the Cryogenian hasn't got one of these. Um, GSSPs yet, but you see that there is one Precambrian boundary that's been defined. That's the base of the Ediacaran, which is the, the uh, youngest Precambrian period. I was involved in the group that um, defined that, although I wasn't very active in the group. I was involved in that in that definition um, about 15, 15 years ago. And now actively there's a, there's a boundary um, that needs to be defined, the base of the Cryogenian. And we've written a paper proposing it should be in Scotland, and we're waiting to see. Um, or what counter proposals come uh, come forward for that? So it's a, it's an active, it's an ongoing um, process. There are quite a few gaps, as you can see, and this this red ellipse illustrates that there are very few of these boundaries that have been defined in the Upper Jurassic and, and Lower Cretaceous. So it's a work in progress. So let's take an example of the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. Um, now historically, um, people um, we're looking at rocks that were kind of either side of this boundary in places where there was an unconformity. And actually that was very convenient at the time because it meant you could easily distinguish uh, one from the other. Uh, but actually there are a number of places in the world where there is sedimentation continuously across, uh, across that boundary. Um, and fossils with skeletons appear above the boundary. And of course it's, it's um, this is, you know, a, a long time problem that Darwin raised about how suddenly this appeared to happen. And indeed there are, um, there is a record of animal life before we get um, animals with hard parts in the, in the record. Um, and so we, we now see it as a part of a continuous history, even though um, what happened at the beginning of the Cambrian actually was, was quite, um, quite rapid and um, a, a lot of um, origination of groups, a lot of turnover, uh, was going on around that time. The Cambrian explosion is a, is a, um, it's a valid term. So that boundary now, where, where can we go and find this boundary? Well, you have to go to, to North America. Um, and thinking about the different organisms that we've got around at that time, um, trilobites, of course, were um, for a long time um, regarded as the sort of well, they're, they're iconic, aren't they? And it would be nice to be able to find enough trilobites and to see enough variation that we could define the boundary uh, on the first uh, occurrence of, of trilobites. But actually, um, trilobites come in a little bit later than several other changes. And so people um, actually have decided not to use trilobites and instead to use um, trace fossils, which seems a bit odd, but um, you do need a particular physiology in order to be able to create um, a distinctive form of trace fossils like, like these here. Um, and so that's what people have ended up um, using. Now, um, there are actually different ways of um, thinking about it in paleontological terms. Um, now, of course, uh, just then I, I slipped by mistake into biostratigraphy from chronostratigraphy. I was uh, implying that that when a fossil first appears is necessarily a synchronous surface around the earth. Well, it, actually, it may not be. Um, but actually, what you have to do is to find a whole assemblage of different fossils um, and see if they're changing in the same way in different parts of the world in order to, to, to demonstrate that it really is chronostratigraphically uh, sensible to define a boundary in that way. But there are other things that can be done. There is um, there's fad or lad. And some paleontologists, like this, this, this chap with a beard here on the left, in fact, they've both got beards, haven't they? But this chap on the left um, is keen on the idea of a first appearance datum. That is the first time the fossils with these blue fossils appear. He said, that's where we should put the boundary. Whereas the one on the right is saying, no, it's the last appearance datum that he thinks is important, with this orange fossil disappearing there. And he would like to put the boundary there. Well, it looks to me as though neither of them are ideal because there's, there's something in the middle where they haven't actually found anything at all. And I think they need to do some more work before they, they come up with a decision there. So in terms of the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary, um, 
Mary Groza here is, uh, has been an influential figure. Um, I had a, a great visit to her department a few years ago and she, she had actually had three of these Barbie dolls on her, um, paleontologist Barbie dolls on, on her shelves, um, ready to give them out as, 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 mo as role models, I think. Um, but she's been very active in this, in this area and was involved in the definition of the, of the boundary. And the boundary location is in Newfoundland, a place called Fortune Head in Newfoundland. And you can see there's a, about 20 meters of um, beds here. Um, it's a bit hairy, as you can see from the people creeping cautiously along the ledge. Um, but in here, there are some characteristic changes in the fossils which have been used to define the boundary. And this is, this is where the GSSP is. Now, here, the geology you saw just now has been turned on its side. So the bottom of the cliff is at the left here, um, down at 0 meters, and the top is at 20 meters. So you can see the different rock types shown diagrammatically along this diagram. And then the lower part of the figure here shows us the occurrence of different types of fossils. So, um, for example, Planolites is a very simple kind of um, trace fossil, just a simple tube. And that occurs in strata that people would like to be Precambrian. So they, they think that uh, that isn't enough to define the Cambrian. They want something a bit more complicated. Um, and one thing that comes in now is this, this fossil called Phycoides pedum, um, uh, which is the one you can see at the upper right there, a more complex uh, kind of burrowing network made by some kind of worm. And that appears there. And uh, so in the context of that appearing, shortly followed by all sorts of other trace fossils like Aranicolites and Scolithos, but also um, uh, also some um, um, fossils with hollow parts coming in fairly soon um, afterwards. So this is this is the so in this case it's the first appearance datum that's used. So uh, as I mentioned just now, a first appearance datum is a bit is a bit of a dodgy thing to use. And ideally you'd want a whole assemblage to change, but this, this is what this is what they had at the time that they defined the boundary. But later uh, Mary Droza was one of the people who wrote in 2001 that they've actually found this fossil um, extending four meters below the GSSP, the base of the Cambrian period at Fortune Head in southeast Newfoundland. So they define the boundary in one place and then later on they find the fossils actually present lower down. So what to do? So uh, just illustrates the kind of practical problems in dealing with this. And they, the practical answer to that is at first you do nothing. You define the boundary, it's gone through all the bureaucratic procedure being approved. That is still the boundary um, until um, it's looked at again. And it, you have to wait 10 years after defining a boundary before, um, before it's looked at again. But anyway, that's, that's uh, an issue that that, that group uh, clearly have to address. If we look through the whole of the Phanerozoic, all of the period from the Cambrian, uh, onwards, um, then there are actually quite a lot of different uh, criteria that are used to uh, help define these GSSPs. Um, so raptolites, for example, uh, 12 GSSPs, so 12 of those boundaries in the Silurian Old Division. Um, we've mentioned trace fossils, but also some, um, uh, some arthropods, uh, agnostids uh, are used. Cone, the microfossil conodonts are quite widely used in the late Paleozoic. We've got mollusks, brachiopods. We've got microfossils, mainly in the Cenozoic. And then we've got some other things, which are different ways of establishing chronostratigraphic um, boundaries. Now, one of them is the iridium anomaly that is associated with the um, extraterrestrial impact that hit the Earth at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary um, and then to the dinosaur extinction and so on. And, and that iridium spike is quite a distinctive feature that is, that is used. In other cases, there are changes in the Earth's magnetic field, which we know are, are global um, and which can be correlated. Um, you know, so if you get an approximate correlation using other means, you can then get the exact correlation using the magnetic uh, reversal. And then when we come closer to the present day, there are lots of cycles caused by wobbles in the Earth's orbit, the Milankovitch cycles which lead to glacials and interglacial fluctuations. And that's a very convenient way of dividing up um, uh, quaternary time. So here we are, here is the quaternary. 
and we can see um, uh, the time going uh, upwards there. And all these uh, variations that we see here are, 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 um, are these interglacial interglacial fluctuations. The blue bars represent reversals in the Earth's magnetic field, which give us a very convenient timeline. So um, the, the quaternary is now um, deemed to start at 2.6 million years at this magnetic reversal, uh, whereas uh, 15 years ago it actually started at 1.8 million years, and and they so it was shift that boundary was shifted down by an enormous amount uh, and the reason that it, it that happened like that was because there are an awful lot more people working on the quaternary than there are on the pliocene the previous period and they seem to shout louder and the argument is really actually that um northern hemisphere glaciation really got going about 2.6 million years and so that, that that was that was the scientific reason for um the boundary being established there and certainly things were colder just at this point here than they had been at any point in the Pliocene. So um, and if we look at that in relation to what human evolution was going on around that time you can see um, there's a lot of interest there with with different hom hominin species being present during much of the quaternary um, compared with the one only the one that we have um, nowadays. So we can see how this how this all fits together. So, and then this time with time going from right to left, you can see that the fluctuations that we see here are due to combinations of the um, characteristic wobbles in the Earth's orbit, these Milankovitch oscillations. And we're in our current interglacial here. There's the last glacial period down here. And, you know, this is something that has continued um, uh, in this way with these very pronounced fluctuations for several million years now. And so, we just happened to be in a warm interglacial. There was one 130,000 years ago, um, and interglacials should end. At least they always have ended up to now. But we'll come back to that later. Now, when we come to um, the start of the Holocene, so if we come right up to the uh, at the top here and the start of this current interglacial, then that's just here. That started um, uh, just 10,600 uh, uh, years ago, and that's the base of the Holocene. And the Holocene is an epoch marking the end of this um, glacial period and moving into the interglacial. And here, the stratigraphers broke new ground because they decided that the best place to define that boundary was in an ice core. And this is a section of core that's been drilled in Greenland. Um, and it's at some considerable depth. You see, we're 1,490 meters below the surface. And you might say, well, why should they put it in the middle of this sort of bland bit of ice here? Well, the reason they put it there is because there is a chemical variation there. There are changes in the isotope signatures of the, of the water molecules that uh, make up the ice which show that the climate was changing pretty quickly at that time. There was quite a rapid warming and that's, uh, that, that occurs across this interval again. So that's, that's why the boundary was put there. But it was certainly breaking new ground to put a boundary in ice rather than rock, which had been the case up till then. Uh, and in fact, since then, they've also uh, um, subdivided the, um, the Holocene. Uh, another boundary has been put at an ice core, and another boundary has been put as defined by a stalagmite from, from a cave in India. So the process of, of defining this then is, um, is something that a, a working group will um, come up with a proposal and they will then recommend it. And it's got to go through this bureaucratic system and a whole series of stages have to go through before um, it is it's actually approved. And it's a conservative process, so that you have to have the, you have to carry the bulk of the people with you, uh, rather like impeaching a president or former president uh, in order for that to succeed. And so, at the moment, um, so whereas in my experience with the Ediacaran uh, system and the way that was defined was that um, everyone realised that they they needed to define it, and everyone agreed um, that there was an obvious way to define it at the end of the last global ice age. So it was just a matter of where. Um, it was to be defined, and, and there's a matter of different countries jockeying for position as to 
you know, who would have the honor of hosting the, uh, the Golden Spy. Um, but when it comes to the Anthropocene, it's been a much more complex process because um, the, the whole um, idea of trying to establish a boundary uh, at a time when we have an enormous array of information about what has changed, which is not in the form of a geological archive. Um, so is it is there any point in doing that or, or why are we doing that? Um, and also, um, given that the, 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 this this new epoch would be something to do with the way that humans have influenced the Earth, um, why should we just focus on one particular period of uh, uh, one particular instant in time rather than look at all the different things that humans have, have done over the uh, uh, over the time that they've been on the Earth? So all the kind of those kind of debates have been have been raging, and there are people on, on the International um, Stratigraphic Commission who are we don't like the idea and obviously others who do so it's it's um at the moment then the proposal hasn't been put forward although an, an enormous amount of groundwork has been done lots of work has been published lots of new data has been obtained um so there's a, a, a tremendous body of information to draw on uh, about that and i'll refer you to one particular article uh, in, in a moment so that's that's the, that's the procedure we haven't got there yet as for, in terms of the anthropocene definition so with the Holocene then, uh, as things stand at the moment, we're still in the Holocene. And the Holocene, um, it corresponds to what Charles Lyell called the recent um, epoch, a time elapsed since the Earth has been tenanted by man, as he thought at the time. Um, and so the, the whole idea of thinking about how um, the Earth has been modified by human action is, has been a, of concern for centuries, actually. And, and George Marsh is one of the people who was, um, wrote a, a textbook about uh, physical geographies modified by human action. But in, in the late 1860s, then Paul Gervais came up with the idea of Holocene, which means fully modern faunas, as opposed to uh, Eocene, which means early life, and then um, Oligocene and, and um, Miocene and Pliocene and so on. Holocene means fully modern faunas, that is the modern faunas in the current interglacial. And uh, so this term Holocene became um, established. And so it was established in the late 19th century, but of course time has continued since then. And so the Holocene has been getting longer and longer. But are we now uh, in a time when the, we're no longer in the Holocene, in which case the Holocene has to stop somewhere. And if so, where did it stop? Well, um, uh, Jan Jelasevich from, from Leicester, is, um, who, who's senior author of this, the paper from which this diagram comes, is, is chair of, has been chair of the uh, Anthropocene Working Group for a number of years. Um, and the working group has assembled all kinds of information about how things have changed to try and get a grip on this. And an argument has emerged that the, the fundamental change is in the middle of the 20th century. Now, lots of people have argued for other periods, and you'll hear more about this from other voices later, um, but the working group's view is that is that 20th century is when things really took off. And, and this um, graph kind of illustrates some of the issues here. So if we look at um, the concentration of methane, in the lower panel, or carbon dioxide in the other panel, this is during the um, Pleistocene, during the last ice age, and then see how it's increased from that ice age to the interglacial. So we've gone from the blue ellipses to the red ellipses, the, both the methane and the CO2. You know, there is a significant increase, but it's it's not, um, uh, it's, it's only changing by a certain fraction. Whereas where we're going now is way out of, um, of, of that space. We're going way beyond that. Um, and uh, as an example of that, the chemical composition of carbon in the atmosphere, as expressed by the relative abundance of the two isotopes of carbon, 13 carbon and 12 carbon, um, that ratio has, has just flipped completely um, already, well, well beyond anything that's, that's happened um, previously. And that's all to do with burning of, uh, of fossil fuels in the atmosphere, changing the uh, composition of the of, of the carbon. 
So where we go in the Anthropocene depends a lot on emissions and human activity um, in the coming uh, years. And uh, so it's very difficult to know where, where we're going to end up. Now, there, there are various, I'm just going to show you some just diagrams to try and illustrate conceptually what is what is changing here. And one of the kind of diagrams that is used is this thing called a ball and cup model. And this has come from people who call themselves um, Earth system scientists. So Earth system scientists look at the Earth and look at its behavior. So they are complementary to stratigraphers who look at the deposits that have formed in the Earth and how they've changed over time. And actually, interestingly, the two viewpoints have converged on the mid 20th century as being a crucial time. So after the mid 20th century, the Earth seems to be moving out of the um, condition that it's been in for these last thousand, ten thousand years in the Holocene. So the Holocene, in the Holocene, there have been some changes. CO2 has gone up and down a little bit. Um, things have got slightly warmer and cooler. But we're, we're now kind of moving out of that, that zone. And actually, we can't get back. We can't just reverse it. Um, it's too late for that. And, and an example of that is the amount of CO2 that's dissolved in the oceans that is gradually working its way through the ocean because the ocean takes a thousand years to circulate completely. So that's carbon dioxide is, is um, uh, there's a signal of heat and acidity that goes along with that, which is taking a thousand years to work through the ocean. So we've set in train something that's really um, uh, beyond our control. So it's all we can do is to try and uh, reduce the acceleration. Oh, and so I just draw the attention of this term, the great acceleration, uh, which uh, Will Stefan, who's on the working group, introduced for changes that happened uh, since the, the Second World War, and you'll, you'll see reference to that later. Um, another of these sort of ball and cop models, but this one is kind of illustrating it in a slightly different way. It's showing the, the Holocene as a, and a, a, as a kind of an attractor, a little basin, where the Earth system might might be. Um, as we're moving through time, um, it's um, that the Holocene basin gets shallower and shallower, and this new Anthropocene basin gets deeper until we move over to this. So the system actually changes its nature um, uh, uh, over time. Um, and so one example of that might be you know, whether or not you have a lot of sea ice in the Arctic. You know, the whole the whole system changes its nature. Um, then you know this, this diagram kind of illustrates that. So here is here is sea ice in the in the Arctic, and if we look at um, of course the sea ice grows during the winter, melts during the summer, and reaches a minimum in September each year. And uh, so the uh, the average um, position, the median position of the edge of the ice in September between 1981 and 2010 is is around here, and and this is where it, is in in 2019 so it's a really major change uh, that's happening and when you have um, seawater rather than ice um, the albedo the reflectivity of the surface is um, so much lower and so much more heat is retained uh, causing more uh, melting of the ice so this is so that varies from year to year as we can see in this graph it's a, it's a really major trend um, now, sea ice melting doesn't itself change sea level. The thing that changes sea level is the warming of the seas and the addition of extra water from melting of um, uh, ice sheets and mountain glaciers. And so this is this is going on. Um, it's accelerating at the moment and uh, could have quite significant effects on coastal communities by the end of the century. So there are a whole series of what are called tipping points where there is concern about what's happening. And you know, groups of scientists are obviously looking very closely at these, these sites to, to, to try and um, warn if, if things are, are getting out of control. But certainly once you start getting up to three degrees, the global mean temperature above um, the pre-industrial levels, then it gets very serious. Um, and so the question about whether we're going back into an ice age, well, maybe, maybe we're not. And, this is the result of some modeling that was done by Will Stefan and others, where they, they say, well, if you look at um, temperature rising and sea level rising and so on, um, 
as we go from a glacial to an interglacial, you go around one bit of this loop, and then you would, in the past, have gone back into another glacial again and around this blue loop time and again. But um, it may be that that's not going to happen, and instead we're going to be moving into some other kind of system. Hopefully, it's not something horrendous like going all the way up there, um, but it's not the same. And the modeling at the moment suggests that the next ice age is cancelled. Um, and now one way people have looked at this, there's a book um, called Six Degrees by Linus, which, which examines this, it's kind of looking back at different times in the geological past, um, and uh, which were progressively one degree warmer, uh, six degrees warmer than, than they are today, and, and looking at those worlds and looking at are we on the way there. So if we look, for example, at the Holocene, you know, we can't go back to the Holocene. We've already changed the Earth. We can't go back. Um, Eemian, that's the last interglacial. Um, so although sea level was higher than today, uh, actually the CO2 level was, wasn't any higher. Um, and so given that we've got very high CO2 now, melting is happening very rapidly, um, it doesn't look as though we're going to access that state. If you go back to the mid Pliocene three or four million years ago, um, CO2 concentrations are 400 to 450 parts per million. They're over 400 now. Um, uh, but then, you know, that was associated with a, a rising sea level of um, 10 to 20 meters. Um, so, um, you know, can we stop at that point? So, um, th th those are the kind of issues in terms of where the Earth is, is, is going um, in terms of that. So, the glacial interglacial. Um, limit here. So these glacial interglacial cycles are the blue part of this diagram and, it, and they're suggesting that we're in, now into a red part of the diagram and we've got to hope that we keep it in the, in the purpley bit rather than the strongly red part. Now one of the um, uh, most perceptive voices in the last century about um, how the planet works and what the future might be is James Lovelock and he um, he is now 101, and in July 2019, on his 100th birthday, he published a book about what he calls the Novocene. And uh, he believes, in fact, that our destiny is to be succeeded by an electronic master race. So, be that as it may, there are lots of there's lots of scope for um, interest and concern about the future. The word Anthropocene um, in its which has accelerated enormously. And that, that, that can be traced back to the Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen, first using the word in, in the year 2000. Um, I mean, he wrote, a daunting task lies ahead for scientists and engineers to guide society towards environmentally sustainable management during the era of the Anthropocene. So that seems like quite a dark slide to finish my talk. So instead, I'll, I'll just have a a nice bright picture of, of Paul Crutzen, um, you know, to celebrate human genius. Um, he helped to understand atmospheric ozone depletion, uh, which led, you know, that's a great environmental triumph of the human race to actually um, pull back on that. Um, he developed ideas about nuclear winter, which of course is warning us not to have a nuclear war, and, and then coining the term um, Anthropocene. Um, now, there is um, the working group has published quite a few different papers, and increasingly these days, you can actually access these publications um, uh, as a member of the public rather than having to belong to a university or something like that. And there's one that's um, on its way out soon called the Anthropocene, comparing its meaning in geology uh, with conceptual approaches arising in other disciplines. So if you if you Google part of that sentence, you can actually um, find uh, that paper which is kind of in press at the moment but there is a version of it that's available um, online um, and that's um, and in, in that in in that so this is this paper and so they're exploring you know just you know, how the lawyer used the term how do historians view this term and so on it's really interesting to see the different approaches that people take to it um, you know in terms of uh, if you're interested in following the background but also in the mid, in the middle of this paper, though, they've got the, the geologists' take on it, and they can compare and contrast the boundary, um, the, the, the base of the Cambrian, 
and, the, and how that's defined with uh, the, the Anthropocene. So that's that, that's the geological take on it. And then the rest of the paper is, is, is about the takes that other disciplines um, have on this uh, on this topic. Now, um, that's the end of the first part. And we're shortly going to be moving on to the second part. And there may, I'm not sure if there needs to be any management here by um, the organizers. So I'm just stopping sharing. And um, so the question is, who is in charge? Is it Ray? Is it Stuart in charge? Or is it me? We've got to just make sure that the people who are down to um, get involved in this have are unmuted. Now I can see Mike's there and he's not unmuted yet. Are you, you have unmuted, that's great. Um, I see Mavi's uh, unmuted and uh, Catherine is, so that's very good. Um, we need Josh and Chris. I think you've got everybody in. Everybody's there, that's great. Um, so, um, right. So, uh, all right. So, all these participants, can you all say hello now? Hello. 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 Very good. Very good. Right. So, I'm now going to um, bring up a different um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. So, I'll just find that. And, and this PowerPoint presentation is called Introducing the Anthropocene. So, it, um, it doesn't assume you know much uh, to begin with, and it just shows you the different takes that people can have on it. Um, so I'm going to share the screen again. Yeah. Okay, that's coming through now. Yeah. Now, um, this is the first time that I've um, done this um, and I also have to change the slides because usually I've, I've, I've uh, designated somebody else to change the slides. It shouldn't be complicated for me to do that because I've got it written down here. Um, so um, that will be good. Now I just want to go to full, full screen mode. There we are, full screen mode. And in a moment we're going to start in introducing the Anthropocene but I am not the first person to speak. So I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet and let that person start. So what's been going on with planet Earth lately? The Anthropocene. Anthropo what? Many say that we already live in the Anthropocene. So you better get used to this word. Anthropo related to humankind, seen refers to a new time period. The time of humans? Well, it means not just the time that we've been here on Earth, but the time when we've come to dominate it to the extent that we change the way it works. A shift in behaviour of the Earth system. Ah, you mean global warming? I suppose most people have taken that on board now. Well, that's part of it. But we're just at the beginning of the consequences of what we have already done. What else then? Christophe Bonnil says that the Anthropocene is the sign of our power, but also our impotence. We've added an extra 1500 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuel. So the world is warmer and more prone to climate catastrophes, reducing ice, rising sea levels. But we can't simply go back. But we're planning to cut these emissions, aren't we? The genie's out of the bottle. Even if we went back to the way things were in 1950, before the Great Acceleration, ice would continue to melt and sea level rise because of all the extra heat and acidity that is slowly spreading through the oceans. And even the most optimistic politicians are aiming to stabilise carbon dioxide at levels that in the geological past would have led to a very different world. Climate is always changing. Climate is always changing, but what's new is our just-in-time civilization. We have finely tuned our infrastructure. 
or I should this is the right side. Uh, we have finally tuned our infrastructure in the richer countries to maximize our profits, but our cities are at sea level. Every storm brings huge economic damage. And in the poorer countries, often water poor and conflict prone, there is little resilience. We have made the world behave in a new way to suit our immediate needs, but only now realize what we are doing. Christophe Bonnet here. Look, this story is that we all know now, no, that we know all now and knew nothing before is just wrong. There have always been voices urging caution and restraint. Who could see the consequences of development? Who could see the myth of sustainability? Well, okay, you were right. There was the great 18th century polymath Humboldt, a geographer before even geography was invented, who saw the consequences of deforestation in, in South America. Oh yes, and Buffon, and Stopani, Vernadsky. Now Vernadsky developed the concept of the biosphere. You've mentioned climate, but what about extinctions? Yes, there is so much to grasp. Every time we change a habitat, the ecosystem changes, and we know that species are going extinct at a much faster rate than normal. What geologists call a mass extinction is in progress, and there have only been a handful of these in all the billions of years of Earth history. Yeah, and what is this great acceleration? Ah, now this is a concept recognised by Will Statham. The end of the Second World War marked the beginning of an era of unprecedented prosperity and progress. Uh, but? But also bigger and better ways to pollute our planet nuclear tests in the atmosphere, and the use of pesticides, fertilizers, the manufacture of concrete, plastics, many things rose exponentially since that time. We humans are like someone who has the chance to drive a really fast car and gets in and gets moving without learning the controls. We're all over the place. So we're in the new geological age, the Anthropocene. Oh, steady on there. You can't just invent new geological eras, periods, epochs and ages. We have the geological police, the ICS, they decide. But everyone talk is talking about it. Yes, but there are so many different ideas about when we should deem it to have started. Now, when Paul Crudson proposed the name in the year 2000, he was thinking of the changes in the air resulting from the Industrial Revolution. Later, Bill Ruddiman told us that thousands of years ago, when we started cutting down trees and growing rice in paddies, we already postponed the next ice age because of all the extra greenhouse gases that were emitted. And Tony Barnofsky takes us back to the early hunters before the end of the last ice age, killing off most of the big animal species, the megafauna. And Will Stephan tells us that the really big change was the great acceleration. A decision has to be made. And the geological police, the ICS, have set up a panel called the Anthropocene Working Group, in which Earth system scientists have been joined by archaeologists, geographers, ecologists, a philosopher and a lawyer. What has it got to do with lawyers? You try keeping lawyers out of anything. International lawyers actually need several decades notice to negotiate new treaties since sea level rise is going to change the world coastline. OK, so this working group has to choose a date to start the Anthropocene, and that's it? Well, not quite. First, we have to convince the ICS that there is something real here. That means something that changes in geological deposits to show we're in this new episode of geological time. OK, so what is a ge geological deposit? Well, it used to mean um, just layers of sediment, but now the definition is wider. The end of the ice age is now defined in a core of ice um, drilled under the Greenland ice cap. And another boundary 4,000 years later, when the climate was dry for a while, is defined in a stalagmite. So anything goes then? Well, not quite. Um, because the Anthropocene is so close to the present day, it will be good to look in some kind of deposit in which you can count the years one by one, like you would in tree rings 
and find some way of measuring a chemical signal that can be traced across the world. Uh, we could do this um, in corals, stalagmites, snow and ice, trees and sediments in certain lakes and ocean basins. Chemical signal, what does that mean? Well, let's take 1950 as an example. As you move through the 1950s, you can find pesticide residues in lake sediments in the remotest parts of the world, sulfate from dirty coal burning in the Himalayas, and everywhere the radioactive isotopes created by nuclear tests in the atmosphere that reached a peak in the early 1960s. Okay, okay. Like, so what? Why fiddle around with all this stuff? Isn't Rome burning according to you? Well, there is something special and meaningful about the golden spike. Golden spike? What golden spike? You know when they built the railroads across America, all those rails were held down by iron spikes. They started from the east and from the west and drove in this symbolic golden spike where they met in the middle. It meant that travel was transformed and they'd entered a new era. So geologists talk about a golden spike at all the boundaries of geological time intervals, like when the asteroid landed at the end of the age of dinosaurs. Okay, it'll be more like a golden pin to start the Anthropocene, but it, it will be an incredibly symbolic act. The geological time scale will be rewritten. No more can we pretend that things are always as they were, that we're just nudging things a little, exonerating ourselves. And maybe, just maybe, we'll put this pin somewhere around the position when the great acceleration was about to start. Now here you, look, I'm an 18th century historian. Now don't tell me that the world wasn't changing then. I'm really hooked on this Anthropocene word. Look at the impacts of coal burning and iron smelting in England and the way that it links to all kinds of social change. Yes, yes, they're quite right. I mean, the local effects were, were really strong, but even so, the worst weather in 1783 and was not caused by humans. Let me introduce you to the Reverend John Stein Grimston from Kirkaba Cloister in southern Iceland. Yes, the fire of the earth came to us at that time. The great Laki Fisur erupted ash and lava that devastated our crops, poisoned the grass for our animals and spoiled your summer too. It was a time which showed the best and worst of human nature as we were attested by these events. And these trials came from God to punish us for the wickedness of men. But no one believes that now. Volcanic eruptions are just the way the earth works. Mm, you might say that, but believe that there are reasons for events. There are consequences for actions. Do you not have morality in your time? Yes. The university departments of philosophy and ethics are full of students. Our governments extol human rights and our responsibilities to the earth. So what is the point of your Anthropocene? The Anthropocene indeed means nothing to victims of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. But there are other natural disasters where we share the responsibility for what happens. By naming it and nailing down its start, we are declaring that something new is happening to the planet and to geological time itself. Reflect on how big a change this is. Hi, ICS here. We received your application for a new division of geological time. There's the question of rank here. Look, it all seems pretty trivial to us. A very short interval of time can't be that important. If we approve this Anthropocene, it should be the very lowest rank. Now, since the end of the Ice Age, we've been living in the Holocene. So how about a new subdivision of the Holocene? That would make it the Anthropocene Age. No way, Stanley. Haven't you seen our publications? We've moved way outside the limits of the Holocene. All that carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere, the sediments moved, the minerals exploited. 
This will be over my dead body, you understand? Or at least something for my successor to decide. Okay, so if you want to stand equal with the Holocene, that would make it the Anthropocene epoch. Okay, well, we might settle for that. But actually, there is a case that things are changing even more fundamentally. Now, the next rank up is the Quaternary Period. It's the time of the Ice Ages. The way we're going, it's possible we could flip the world out of the pattern of Ice Ages, and then sea level would rise to 70 metres higher than today. Well, the IC ICS might well prefer to wait and see. Don't tell me that you want to go even higher in rank for your Anthropocene. Fancy making it a new era alongside the Paleozoic, Mosaic, and Cenozoic. Why not? Those multi-million year eras were bounded by a mass extinction. We're in the middle of one now. Okay then, just go for the top one. A new eon. What does it matter that we only have three at the moment for the whole history of the planet? The last one started when animals evolved 540 million years ago. So at the same time, retain... For now, we're just a few decades into something, and all we know is that changes are in train that we are powerless to reverse. We just don't know how it will end. We are not masters of the planet, but we are still responsible for its future. <laughs>